Hello there, my little ninjas. This is Vimal Makshita, and I welcome you all to PW Gulf. Now, I know we are meeting after a lot of time, but then I have come here with the summary of the chapter Carbon and its Compounds. So, what are we going to learn in our chapter today? Well, let's see. So, today we are going to learn about, we are basically going to learn about what exactly is carbon as an element, alright. So, we will be having a brief introduction about carbon, okay. After that, we shall be learning, we shall be learning a certain important terms, certain important terms, alright. After that, we will be learning about the versatile nature versatile nature of carbon. We will then learn about <clears throat> the homologous series the electron dot structure all right after that, after that, we shall be learning, after learning the electron dot structure, we shall be learning about the saturation. What exactly is saturation? That is saturated and unsaturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons. And then we will learn about alkanes. Alkenes and alkynes in detail. We will also learn about nomenclature. But nomenclature is going to happen before we learn about alkane, alkene and alkyne. And after that, finally we will learn the chemical properties of carbon compounds. And we will end the session with soaps and detergents. So, why the weight? Let's start. Let's start with the placement of carbon in the periodic table. See, this is the periodic table and it has all the elements that are so far, so far discovered and are placed in a particular manner in the particular periodic table. Now, when you look at the positioning of carbon, this is carbon. Okay. So, the symbol of carbon is C. All right. The symbol of carbon is C. It is, its atomic number is 6 and its atomic mass is 12. And its atomic mass is 12. Its atomic mass is 12. And you have already learnt in your ninth grade how <coughs> the atomic number lets us know about the valency of an element. Right? And it is this valency of an element which is nothing but the combining capacity of an element based on which it forms a certain type of bonds, right? So, this is something about carbon. Now, let's first try to understand why are we putting a load of emphasis on carbon as an element, right? No other element we are putting this amount of emphasis on, but on carbon we are putting a lot of emphasis. So, the question is why? What is the reason that we are so dedicatedly trying to understand about carbon? And the reason is very simple, Bacha. The reason is very, very simple, which is in this universe, in this universe, you know, or I'll not say universe, but I'll say that most of the things that you see around yourself has carbon in it. And if I have to still, you know, uh, shorten the spectrum, I can say all living organisms have carbon in their system. Ma'am, how? The cell wall that you see, the cell membrane that you see has carbon. The DNA that you see has carbon. The proteins that you have are made up of amino acids which in turn have carbon in its constituent. Right? Then the food that you have has carbon as its constituent. All right. The paper that you're using, it has some amount of carbon. The pencil that you're using, it has graphite in it. So, carbon as an element is all around us. As an element is all around us, we exhale carbon dioxide. 
right so when you talk about an element which is able to form such a large number of products such large number of compounds which are different from one another it's not like they're all having the same characteristics no they are different from one another so something must be special about it right and another thing is it forms the bonds it forms the compounds via a certain specific bond we have so far learned about ionic bond in the chapter metals and non-metals but now we will try to understand another bond and you will probably be hearing it for the first time but no worries but no worries it is something that is very easy to understand so let's start off so let's start off now when you look at this okay vital force theory let me tell you it was one of the very starting theories to establish the fact that there are cer certain things known as organic compounds see compounds are of two types beta organic or inorganic organic compounds are the compounds which we see which are found in organisms okay which are obtained from organisms inorganic compounds were inanimate things but that does not mean that organic compounds can be generated only by living organisms no we can generate them in labs as well right and it's not like inorganic compounds are just generated by inanimate animals or sorry inanimate substances no right so let's now try to understand the branch of chemistry which deals with just and just carbon and its various compounds which is organic chemistry and the laying the laying or the idea or the thought of organic chemistry as a branch started somewhere here so with the vital force theory around the year 1780 chemists began to distinguish between organic compounds obtained from plants and animals and inorganic compounds prepared from mineral sources prepared from what beta mineral sources okay so a swedish chemist berzelius proposed a vital force theory which said that a vital force is required a vital force is present okay which is responsible for the formation of these organic compounds and he laid down a certain set of principles what are the certain set of principles now the synthesis of organic compounds requires a vital force that the synthesis of organic compounds requires a vital force organic compounds cannot be made in the laboratory from inorganic compounds organic compounds cannot be made in the laboratory from the inorganic compounds which today we know is not true but at that time this was a very limited piece of information then only living organisms contain this vital force then his his theory was discarded or i would rather say proved wrong by wohler what did wohler say wohler said that okay he was considered by many chemists as the father of organic chemistry because he demonstrated that you could take a non living mineral like ammonium cyanate which is over here nh4 dot cno ammonium cyanate and make a substance that is present in living beings that is urea so wohler was the first one to discard the vital force theory and not just discard the vital force theory with a proper justification he gave a proof that no sir it's not that you know you can create organic compounds or organic compounds can be created by organisms only no you can do the same in labs as well and he did it and he proved and after that many other scientists you know went about on this journey then what happened then what happened then what happened compounds were formed these compounds that were formed now there is some kind of bond between the compounds right the elements have some kind of bond between them and that is what leads to the formation of molecules and then molecules eventually give rise to compounds we have learnt about the octet rule we have learnt about the octet rule when we were trying to understand ionic bonding in metals and non-metals and it states that the octet rule is a chemical rule of thumb that reflects the theory that main group elements tend to bond in such a way that each atom has eight electrons in its valency shell giving it the same electronic configuration as a noble gas in simpler terms if i have to say then every element tries to attain the octet configuration the noble gas configuration of the nearest noble gas present to it 
okay so every element tries to obtain the valency shell configuration or the octet configuration of the noble gas which is nearest to it which is nearest to it beta all right so we have learnt about it we have already learnt about it previously we have already learnt about it previously so the outer shell must have the valency shell must have eight electrons okay every every electron every element tries to attain that but what is the problem with carbon what is the problem with carbon and why is it that carbon is forming a different kind of bond see loss cosel and lewis theory cosel and lewis theory this is the theory given by cosel and lewis two scientists cosel lewis two scientists cosel and lewis they gave the cosel and lewis theory now what does this theory state See, Cossel proposed the idea of the formation of idea of the formation of ionic bonds. Lewis, on the other hand, proposed the idea of sharing of electrons for the formation of ionic bonds. So basically, what happens is Cossel and Lewis developed the electronic theory of valence to explain the formation of chemical bonds between the two atoms. According to this theory, every atom tries. to attain octet configuration in its valency shell by losing or gaining or by sharing of electrons so basically basically what did what did cosel say that every element every at every element okay tries to attain uh, tries to attain stability stability by the formation of a bond okay and cosel said it is going to be by transfer of electrons transfer of electrons now this transfer of electrons beta this transfer of electrons is possible either by the gain of electrons or the loss of electrons if gain of electrons happens anion is formed if loss of electrons happens cation is formed and when two ions are present ionic bond is formed so cosel basically proposed the theory of ionic bond formation lewis on the other hand said that an atom an atom an atom of an element tries to attain atom of an element tries to attain stability by the formation of bond of course but how by sharing of electrons by sharing of electrons by the sharing of electrons and such bonds are known as bonds formed by bonds formed by sharing of electrons is known as a covalent bond and one thing you need to understand beta in ionic bond what is happening is an element is losing its electron that is losing its electron to another element and that element is gaining the electron right so the element is actually losing its losing its identity in in the sharing there is no loss of identity no identity is lost per se clear and covalent bond is formed covalent bond is formed bachche now let's try to understand a certain few terms only then will this chapter or this topic make a little sense to you and you'll come across a lot of terms to be very honest throughout this chapter because you're coming across okay or this is just i would say the beginning of the understanding of the 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 relationship or the property of carbon that it has with other elements right and you're coming across this for the first time so most of the things that you come across over here most of the terms that you come across over here will be new to you will be the first thing that you hear okay and it's probably the first time that you're hearing it but that's all right try to understand what they mean and eventually you'll get the hang of it okay starting with the term catenation what is catenation see carbon atoms have a unique property of linking together in straight chains branched chains or rings of various sizes forming a large number of organic compounds okay carbon has the tendency beta carbon has the tendency to form large chains 
okay that is the reason why it is able to form your dna it is able to form your you know your your cell your entire body is made up of carbon carbon has this ability to form long chains and form long branches okay and this is known as catenation this property of carbon to form long chains long chains is known as catenation and the reason for this is beta it's a small size it's a small size the reason for it is it it's small size now you must be saying ma'am even silicon probably is able to form chains yes but for silicon it does not exceed more than 4 to 8 atoms of silicon but for carbon it does carbon is able to form bonds with its own cell that is carbon is able to form a bond with another carbon and that carbon with another carbon so on and so forth to form long chains long rings okay and this is known as catenation whereas other element which is also known but silicon cannot form for more than 4 to 8 silicon atoms that's that but carbon it can just go on and on and on all right beta okay then we talk about tetravalency now this is what you need to understand beta carbon has tetravalency carbon has tetravalency how is carbon having tetravalency see carbon ओके अटोमिक नंबर इज सिक्स के एल एम एन ओके के शेल कैन ऑक्यूपाई मैक्सिम ऑफ टू इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एल विल हैव फोर इलेक्ट्रॉन नाउ यू सी देर आर फोर इलेक्ट्रॉन्स नाउ फॉर अ ऑक्टेट ओके फॉर कार्बन टू अटेन ऑक्टेट फॉर द कार्बन टू अटेन ऑक्टेट इट शुड ईदर इट शुड ईदर गेन फॉर इलेक्ट्रॉन्स ओके ओके इट शुड ईदर गेन फॉर इलेक्ट्रॉन्स or it should either lose four electrons both of which are difficult why now listen gaining an electron is not that easy a process right let's say it is gaining four electrons the number of protons still remains six but the electron becomes 10 it is very difficult for six protons to be able to you know hold on to the 10 electrons to hold on to the 10 electrons right one two possible but four that's a lot you know more than three it becomes difficult when the difference is more than three it becomes difficult for the atom to be able to sustain its stability right all right ma'am then let it lose four electrons okay let's say it is losing four electrons the proton is still six electron is two after losing now it is six protons and two electrons you know that the proton is inside the nucleus and here somewhere are the electrons this proton will pull the electrons towards itself you see the difference four six is to two that is three is to one right happily it can you know grab the electrons towards itself right B both the cases the atom is losing its stability it is disintegrating that is when lewis's approach comes into picture all right you have four electrons right okay let's do one thing you share it with another element right you share your four electrons that way when sharing of four electrons takes place it already has four it needs another four electrons that needs to be shared 4 plus 4 becomes 8 that is tetravalency of carbon and that is what is explained over here carbon can neither no lose nor gain electrons to attain an octet you have now understood how and you have now understood why right thus it shares four electrons it shares all the four electrons with the other atoms all right beta and this characteristic of carbon by virtue of which it forms four covalent bonds see if it is sharing with four other atoms right so it is forming four covalent bonds it is known as tetravalency of carbon okay now what is saturated you see this man is saturated he is like frustrated ma'am carbon compounds are also frustrated no that is not what i'm getting at what i'm trying to get is what is saturation when you reach the maximum so we will come across this but i just want you to know see saturated compounds are those compounds which have the maximum number of hydrogens for a given number of carbon which has the maximum number of hydrogens such carbon compound is said to be saturated 
right and those carbon compounds which which for a given number of carbon atoms don't have the maximum number of hydrogens are unsaturated all right so those compounds these compounds are organic compounds that have only one carbon to carbon single bond man single bond don't worry we'll get there we'll get there calm down and these compounds are organic compounds that have double or triple carbon to carbon bonds you will see that too don't worry now what is a covalent bond what is a covalent bond see you have understood why carbon cannot gain or lose electron that is the reason why it is now sharing electrons because of the ability to share electrons the kind of bond that is it is forming is not any random bond but a covalent bond and the number of electrons that it is sharing is 4 thereby it is tetravalent also right that is why it is tetravalent you have already seen that carbon that carbon is able to able to form a covalent bond this we have understood this we are clear about now what you need to understand is beta that when one electron is shared that is when one electron see carbon has four electrons when one electron is shared and always understand two electrons need to be shared to form a single bond to form a single bond now when carbon is sharing when carbon is sharing one electron one of its electron with another it is forming a single bond okay one electron each but when carbon is sharing two of its electrons with the electrons of other element it is forming a double bond it is forming a double bond beta it is forming a double bond and when it is sharing three of its with another element, it is forming one, two, three, triple bond. So, compounds which show a single pair of electrons are shared, fluorine, chlorine, hydrogen. For two pairs, oxygen, carbon dioxide. For three pairs, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. Ma'am, how is it, ma'am? We will understand that when we do electron dot structure in a couple of minutes. Okay, in a couple of minutes. Here we go. Electron dot structure on the board. See, the electron dot structure, it is also known as Lewis dot structure, wherein what we are doing is we are, we are, uh, you know, electron dot, that is we are representing the electrons in the form of a dot around the symbol of that particular element. Ma'am, so we are uh, putting all the electrons? No. We are actually representing the valence electrons with the help of dots, beta. We are representing valence electrons with the help of dots, okay, around the symbol of the particular element. Okay, it is also known as Lewis dot structure as it was given by Lewis. Okay, bache. Now, see, these are the electron dot structures of the, of the, first 20 elements first 20 elements and their electron dot structure please have a look at it please definitely have a look at it uh, if required please take a screenshot this is the electron dot structure of the first 20 elements now look at neon and argon what did i tell you the electron dot structure represents the number of valency electrons that are present Okay, in the form of dots around the symbol of the element. So, when you look at neon and argon, they have 8, that is they have an octet in its valency shell. Ma'am, helium has 2. Yes, helium has 2. Helium is the only noble gas to have duplet. Duplet. Okay, beta. So, let's now try to understand how. How do we understand, how do we understand how to write the Lewis dot structure for a certain few elements? Starting with the first one, let's take CH4 beta. Let's take CH4. So, what we are going to do is, what we are going to do is, we are first going to write the atomic number. What is the atomic number? 6. Then, then the valency electron. How many valence electrons does it have? K, L, M, N, 2, 4. So, 4 is the number of valency electrons. We will represent that. Okay. Now, this is for carbon. 
similarly for hydrogen atomic number of hydrogen 1 valence electron 1 how is it represented like this so c h 4 so what you are going to do is you are going to write c and to that you are going to write its electron dot now with respect to hydrogen beta i am taking a different color just so that makes sense to you with each of the electron valence electron of carbon hydrogen is sharing its electron now, this way, after sharing is take, taken place, the number of electrons after sharing with carbon is 8. It has fulfilled its octet. And with hydrogen, after sharing 1, 2, 3, 4. And that is why, that is why, the structure is this is the structure of CH4. Let's do one more molecule. Let's do one more molecule. Let's do one more molecule. Um, let's do carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide let's do carbon dioxide okay so what is the valency okay carbon atomic number 6 valency electron beta what is the valency electron valency electron is Four. What is the structure? Okay, for oxygen. Let me draw it a little smaller. So, that will be clear. Oxygen beta. Atomic number 8, valency electron 6, okay, valency electron is 6. So, for carbon dioxide, all you have to focus is on the fact that beta the octet is fulfilled for both the electrons that are taken. So, now let us see if the octet is fulfilled for carbon. Yes, ma'am, the octet is fulfilled for carbon. Is the octet fulfilled for oxygen? The octet is fulfilled for oxygen as well. And this looks like, see, double bond O, double bond O. So, this is how the Lewis dot structure is used to represent the molecules. Let us now try to understand the term allotropy. The term allotropy. What is allotropy beta? The phenomena in which the element exists in two or more different physical states with similar chemical properties is known as allotropy. So, it is capable of existing in different states, different physical states having the same chemical property and this stands for the element. And you can see that carbon is present as graphite, diamond, fullerene, graphene, etc. These are some of the these are some of the allotropes of carbon, but we are going to discuss about we are going to discuss about graphite.
fullerene and diamond. See, the element carbon occurs in different forms in nature with widely varying physical properties. See, this physical state is different. Physical properties will be different. Chemically, they are going to be the same because it is of the same element, right? Both diamond and graphite are formed by carbon atoms. The difference lies in the manner in which they are arranged. How these carbon atoms are arranged. Let's see. Let's look at diamond. You see the structure of diamond over here. See how, how it is nicely in the form of a cage. Look at the structure of the diamond over here. So, they are saying that in this carbon atom is bonded to four other atoms of carbon forming a three-dimensional structure. It is forming a three-dimensional structure and diamonds can be synthesized by subjecting. How can they be synthesized by subjecting pure carbon to very high pressure and temperature? When you subject pure carbon to very high temperature to very high pressure, then what you get is the diamond. These synthetic diamonds are small but are otherwise indistinguishable from natural diamonds. Okay, next. It is the, now some of the properties of diamonds are, it is the hardest substance and is an insulator beta. It does not conduct electricity. It is used, it is used for drilling rocks and cutting because it is the hardest material. And of course, the jewelry, of course, the jewelry. All right, it is used for making a jewelry. What next, ma'am? Now the Buckminster Fullerene. Look at the structure. It's more or less like the football. It is more or less like what, beta? It is more or less like the football. It is more or less like the football. Fullerenes form another class of carbon allotropes. They form another class of carbon allotropes. The first one to be identified was C60, which has carbon atoms arranged in the shape of a football. And since this looked like geodesic dome designed by US architect Buckminster Fuller, it was named after him. And they, it is a dark solid. It is a dark solid at room temperature. Now, what about graphite? See, but a graphite, now graphite is different, okay? Graphite is in the form of layers, layers, and it is very slippery, okay? And it happens to have an electron, an, a weakened electron, an electron, a single electron between these layers because of which it is very good conductor of electricity. And graphite at the same time is very shiny. It is also used as a lubricant because of its slippery nature. So, with this, we are done with the allotropes of carbon. So, when I talk about the versatile nature of carbon, carbon is said to be one of the most versatile elements and the reason for it is its tetravalency and its catenation property, right? And you all know, you all know what catenation and tetravalency is. Now, what are saturated and unsaturated carbon compounds, beta? Uh, before we get into this, I want you to know that hydrocarbons, what are hydrocarbons? Hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons are nothing but, hydrocarbons are nothing but compounds of, they are nothing but compounds of hydrogen and carbon. They are compounds of hydrogen and carbon. That is why they are known as hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons I am writing as HC, these hydrocarbons are of three types. One is alkene, the other is alkene and finally we have alkyne. The general formula of alkene, a, alkene is CN, H2N plus 2. Alkene is CN, H2N. Alkyne is CN, H2N minus 2. Now, when you look at this, beta, now when you look at this, look at this, look at the general formula of alkene. For n number of carbon atoms, for n number of carbon atoms, it has 2N plus 2 hydrogen. Whereas for alkene, for n number of carbon atoms, it only has 2n hydrogens. And for alkynes, for n number of carbon atoms, it has 2n minus 2 hydrogen atoms. So, what do you understand from this? That alkanes are the ones, alkanes are the ones, alkanes are the ones, they have, have the maximum number of, they have the maximum 
नंबर ऑफ हाइड्रोजन एटम्स फॉर अ गिवन नंबर ऑफ कार्बन एटम्स ओके एल्केन्स हैव द मैक्सिमम नंबर ऑफ हाइड्रोजन एटम्स फॉर अ गिवन नंबर ऑफ कार्बन एटम्स एंड दैट इज व्हाई एल्केन्स आर said to be saturated having the maximum number of hydrogens they are saturated with respect to hydrogens whereas alkenes and alkynes are both unsaturated they are both unsaturated beta so this is about alkenes i've already told you cn h2n plus 2 cn h2n plus 2 and they are all connected they are all connected by they are all connected by they are all connected by what beta they are all connected by a single bond they are all connected by a single bond see what happens is what happens is when you talk about alkanes they have have they have single bond between 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 carbon and carbon they have single bond between carbon and carbon example is methane ethane etc when you talk about alkenes the general formula is cnh2n and they have they have they have double bond between carbon and carbon okay and when you talk about alkynes the general formula is cnh2n minus 2 and they have triple bond between carbon and carbon now you must be wondering ma'am why are they unsaturated why is it that alkenes and alkynes are unsaturated but are their electrons which were used to bond with another element to form a single bond is now forming a double bond instead of instead of for, for you know forming a, a hydrogen for reacting you know forming or sharing an electron with hydrogen it is sharing electrons within itself okay within itself with another carbon atom and that is the reason why it is unsaturated now what are homologous series see series of organic compounds having the same functional group and chemical properties are known as homologous series and they are differed by ch2 unit or 14 mass unit ma'am why 14 mass unit when you look at ch2 unit mass of carbon is 12 hydrogen is 1 into 2 thereby 12 plus 2 14 u is the mass unit of ch2 unit clear that is why and there are homologous series for alkanes alkenes and alkynes let's see let's see let's say alkanes okay this is your alkanes this is your alkenes And this is your alkynes. Okay, general formula. CnH2n plus two. CnH2n. CnH2n minus two. Now, when the number of carbon atom is one. it is going to be ch4 for two carbon atoms c2h6 three carbon atoms c3h8 four carbon atoms c4h10 five carbon atoms c5h12 so on and so forth so on and so forth for one it is not possible because double bond and triple bond is formed between what beta two carbon atoms So the formula for C N H two N is C two H four C three H six C four H eight C five H ten. Now over here, beta C two H two C three H four C four H six. C five H eight, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. Now, but when you look at it, between this and this, the difference is one C H two unit. So is the case over here, C H two unit, C H two unit, C H two unit. You're adding a C H two unit, and you're getting the successive successive alkenes. So is the case over here. You're adding a C H two unit. 
you're adding a CH2 unit and you're getting the successive alkenes. Similarly, you're adding the su successive with CH2. Thereby, you're getting your successive alkynes. So on and so forth, right? But the thing is, CH4 and C2H6 is homologous. C2H6 and C3H8 are homologous. But CH4 and C3H8 are not homologous because the difference is not CH2. However, they are part of the same homology, thereby homologous series. And so is the case for alkenes and alkynes. However, alkenes and alkenes can never be homologous. Alkenes and alkynes can never be homologous. And alkanes and alkynes can never be homologous. And why say versa? Clear? So this is this is the this is the homologous series, beta. This is what beta? This is the homologous series. Now, what is the characteristic? Characteristic. See, members of a given homologous series have the same functional group. They'll have the same functional group. And all the members of the homologous series show similar chemical properties. Similar chemical properties. So, if I know the property of methane, it applies to all the alkenes. Chemical properties, not physical. If I know the chemical property of ethene, it applies for all the alkenes. If I know for ethyne, it applies for all the alkynes. Right? So, chemical properties, if you know for one, one member of the homologous series, it applies for all, all the members of that particular homologous series. Is it not making our task easier? Right? So, let's now try to understand isomerism. Iso means same. What is mer over here? Unit. Unit of what? The structure. Okay, the mass, the functional group, the formula. So, structures or I would rather say compounds, okay, which have the same formula but different structures. Well, isomerism is of two types, structural and stereo. However, in your portion, you have chain isomerism and positional isomerism. So, chain and positional isomers are those isomers which have the same chemical formula but their structure is different. Their structure is different beta. Their structure is different. Now, talking about nomenclature, how do we name a given compound? How do we name a given compound? We have to name a compound, right? How do we name it though? So, there are a certain set of rules. See, my name is specific to me and you identify me by that. Your name is specific to you and people identify you by that. Similarly, compounds also need a name, right? So, how do we write the name? See, you identify the number of carbon atoms in the compound. That is the first thing, to identify the number of carbon atoms. So, for 1, it's meat, 2, eat, 3, prop, 4, but, 5, pent, 6, hex, 7, hept, 8, oct, 9, non, and 10 is dec. Clear? Now, what are the functional groups, beta? First is the halo group, chloro, bromo, okay, oxygen, oxygen containing groups are OH which is alcohol, aldehyde C double bond OH, ketone C double bond O, carboxylic acid COOH, this can also be written as CHO, this can also be written as CO and this can also be written as COOH. OH. Clear, beta? So, how do we write the name of the compound first? We take the word root which tells you about, which tells you about, which tells you about the number of carbon atoms present. Then the suffix, we have a primary suffix and a secondary suffix. Primary suffix will tell you about degree of unsaturation. If all single bonds are there, in. For single bond, in. For double bond, in. For triple bond. 
वॉट इज द सेकेंडरी सफिक्स secondary suffix if oh is there all if c h o all the hide is there all if ketone is there on and if carboxylic acid is there oic acid oic acid prefix if halogen is there beta if chlorine or bromine is there then you will write chloro or bromo that's it so there are a set of rules you first identify the number of carbon atom then in case of functional group is present it is indicated in the name of the compound with either a prefix or a suffix then in the name of the functional group is given as a suffix and suffix of the functional group begins with the vowel a e i o u then then the name of the carbon chain is modified by deleting the final e and adding the appropriate suffix okay propane on is there e is cancelled propanone okay and if the carbon chain is unsaturated then the final ane in the name of the carbon chain is substituted by ene or ine as given in the table this is the table look at the table so chloropropane bromopropane propanol this was propane prop for three carbons in since no one saturation plus on starting with a vowel cancel prop an on clear so this is how you will name the compounds beta this is how naming of the compounds will take place now let's try to name these compounds let's try to name these compounds so what is this compound ch3 ch3 br so the first one the first one beta the first one is nothing but ch3 ch3 br this is nothing but how many carbons are there two eth plus see the degree of unsaturation double bond you have to check between carbon atoms only any any double bond within carbon atoms no in bromine is there always as prefix so this is going to be bromo ethane now the second one how many carbon atoms are there one that is meth uh, any degree of unsaturation between carbon atoms no in cho is the functional group beta all methanol and for the third one for the third one count the number of carbon atoms 1 2 3 4 5 6 hex is there degree of unsaturation yes ain hex ain so this is nothing but hexane we have gotten the three names clear this is how the three are named now let's talk about the chemical properties now we are moving towards the end slowly and steadily we are moving towards the end let's now try to talk about the chemical properties see carbon compounds are known to be known to be uh, you know combustible that is they undergo the process of combustion what is combustion you have learned this in your 8th grade combustion is nothing but combustion is nothing but when a compound is burnt in excess of oxygen it gives rise to carbon dioxide sorry it gives rise to products in this case it is carbon dioxide it gives rise to products along with heat and light now since there are since these are hydrocarbons hydrocarbons that is carbon and hydrogen com containing compounds when they are treated with oxygen the carbon is converted to carbon dioxide hydrogen is converted to hydrogen the uh, hydrogen oxide that is nothing but water along with heat and light right similarly when carbon burns in air or oxygen to give carbon dioxide and heat and light carbon just carbon burns in oxygen to give rise to carbon dioxide along with heat and light okay saturated hydrocarbons like methane basically when you see the term saturated hydrocarbons the only thing that needs to come to your mind is alkenes okay saturated hydrocarbons burn with a blue flame in the presence of sufficient supply of air methane in the presence of oxygen gives rise to carbon dioxide hydrogen plus heat and light now 
see when they are not when they are not you know there as in if uh, enough oxygen is not supplied then a formation of black color sooty layer is seen formation of black colored sooty layer is seen this is because of incomplete combustion because combustion requires excess of oxygen okay so in presence of limited supply of air saturated hydrocarbons they form a sooty flame unsaturated hydrocarbons they burn with a yellow smoky flame yellow smoky flame okay the gas and kerosene stuff used at home has inlet for air so that burn to give clean blue flame due to the presence of small amount of nitrogen and sulfur coal and petroleum produces carbon dioxide with oxides of nitrogen and sulfur which are the major pollutants now talking about oxidation but the difference between combustion and oxidation is oxidation takes place in the presence of an oxidizing agent what is the oxidizing agent over here alkaline kmno4 acidified k2cr2o7 where kmno4 is potassium permanganate k2cr2o7 is potassium dichromate so but always remember alcohol alcohol is always oxidized it is oxidized it is oxidized to give rise to carboxylic carboxylic acid and here you can see ethanol gives rise to ch3 ch2h gives rise to ch3cooh ethanol is giving rise to ethanoic acid what is addition reaction now addition reaction something is being added something is being added so you already know that your alkenes are there your alkynes are there they are unsaturated they have less number of hydrogens for a given number of carbon atoms so what is possible for them you can add hydrogen to them therefore alkenes and alkynes can undergo can undergo addition reaction where hydrogen is added to them and since a hydrogen is added to them it is also known as hydrogenation reaction and that is what you see over here and that is what you see over here and and a catalyst is used which is palladium or nickel okay and this is what you see beta vegetables oils generally have long unsaturated carbon chains while animal fats have saturated carbon chains okay what is substitution reaction what is substitution reaction when one of the hydrogens when one of the hydrogen is substituted is replaced basically displaced by another 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 element it is known as substitution reaction here you can see methane is reacting with the cl2 methane is reacting with cl2 to give rise to ch3cl plus hcl ch3cl plus hcl and this reaction takes place place beta in the presence of sunlight always remember never forget it never forget it okay and chlorine is added to hydrocarbons and this is a very very fast reaction beta a lot of compounds are formed a lot of compounds are formed okay okay which are homologous which are homologous of alkanes or homologous of alkanes let's now look at ethanol ethanol and ethanoic acids are two important they are two important i would say um, two important entities or i would rather say two important carbon compounds and ethanol its formula is c2h5oh which is nothing but ch2ch2oh it is commonly known as ethyl alcohol it is colorless and it is inflammable liquid beta it is colorless it is inflammable and it is miscible with water that is it mixes with water in all proportions and it has no effect on litmus paper it has no effect on litmus paper next what are the reactions what are the reactions see ethanol reacts with sodium to give rise to sodium ethoxide basically you need to understand ch3 ch2 o h plus na okay two moles of na two moles of this this hydrogen is replaced by sodium beta it gives rise to ch3 ch2 o na sodium this is ethane right but oxygen is there sodium ethoxide plus h2 <coughs> now reactive reaction with concentrated h2so4 always remember concentrated h2so4 is a dehydrating reagent so let's now write it ch3 ch i can write another h down 
O H. Okay, beta. Wait, wait, wait. I made a mistake. Yeah, I can write it like this: C H two H C H two O H. I can write it like this: C H three C H two O H. Okay, in the presence of concentrated H two S O four. What happens is this hydrogen and this uh, OH is removed, and these bonds come over here, and we get CH two double bond CH two plus H two O. Clear, beta. Now, what is ethanoic acid? How is ethanoic acid prepared? We have already seen. We have already seen ethanol. when undergoes oxidation in the presence of alkaline kno4 or acidic k2cr2o7 it gives rise to ethanoic acid we have seen it we have seen it under oxidation its formula is ch3cooh it is also known as vinegar when 5 to 8 percent of uh, ethanoic acid is mixed it is mixed in water it is known as vinegar Okay, the melting point of pure ethanoic acid is two ninety Kelvin, and in in cold places it freezes. Thereby, it is also known as glacial acetic acid. What is its properties? It is colorless and pungent smelling. Okay, it is also miscible with water, and it turns blue litmus to red. What does it mean turning blue litmus to red? It is acidic in nature, bache. Let's now look at its. Let's now look at its. chemical formula let's now look at its chemical formula reaction of ethanoic acid with ethanol yes ethanoic acids react with ethanol to give rise to ester okay it gives rise to ester saponification reaction is when this ester reacts with when this ester reacts with naoh it gives rise to ethanol it gives rise to ethanol plus sodium ethanoate which is a soap which is a soap and reaction with carbonates and hydrogen carbonates it reacts with carbonates and hydrogen carbonates to give rise to soap again to give rise to soap again now what is a soap what is a detergent we all use soap we all use detergent but i want you to understand soap works well soap work works well with soft water and its formula is rcoona which you have seen you know from ester when ester is reacted with ester is reacted with uh, sodium hydroxide it gives rise to soap that is rcoona that is rco and where, where r is a long chain beta it is a long chain the difference between soap and detergent is this detergent is nothing but it is a long chain of fatty acids okay it is the ammonium and sulfonate salts of long chain fatty acid that is so3na SO three Na. It is not COO Na, beta. It is SO three Na. It is a long chain fatty acid of ammonium and sulfonate salts. And what is hard water? Hard water is nothing but hard water is nothing but it contains the bicarbonates, chlorides, and sulfates of calcium and magnesium. It contains the bicarbonates, chlorides, and sulfates of potassium. Uh, sorry, calcium and magnesium. Basically, the ones the water which is rich in the salt of calcium and magnesium is known as hard water. It does not give lather. It does not give the froth, the foam that easily. there is soft water it lacks beta it lacks these salts and even if present they are present at very minute concentrations and it lathers well so difference between a soap and a detergent is it is the sodium or potassium salts of long chain fatty acids this is ammonium and sulfonate salts of long chain fatty acids the ionic part is coona the ionic part is so3 na okay this It, its efficiency decreases in hard water efficiency is unaffected by hard water does really work works really well in hard water this is biodegradable this however beta is non biodegradable it is non biodegradable so why is it that we use detergents is there an advantage of using detergents against that of soaps yes because they are highly effective beta detergents are highly effective they are highly highly effective in hard water soap is not okay soap is not soap is unable to produce a lot of lather in hard water that is why detergents have an advantage over over soap now this is a micelle beta the cleaning action is let's say this is a this is this is a cloth this is your cloth and this is the dirt on the cloth this is the dirt on the cloth 
so a micelle is formed what is a micelle micelle is nothing but beta look at this the chain this is your this is your long chain fatty acid okay where each each peak and each fall represents the carbon atoms and it can be a lot beta followed by c o o n e now this beta this this tail is hydrophobic that is is phobic of water whereas this is the head okay this is hydrophilic so this is what your soap or detergent looks like okay okay now let's say this is the dirt this is the dirt now to the dirt the hydrophobic part attaches to the dirt because the dirt is made up of car organic compound no and the ionic compound and the ionic head is phased outside to interact with water and when water comes when water comes when this interacts with when this interacts with water water washes this whole thing away it washes this entire thing away this is the micellar action this is the formation of this is the formation of a you know the micelle and removal of and the removal of the dirt from clots so with this kids we have come to the end of the session i hope you were able to understand it and if you have any doubts you can always always go through the video and reach out to me in the comment section in the chat section and i will be back to you all right then until we meet next keep smiling keep revising and stay healthy bye bye